uh, some of the, the things that have started to develop. And we could also take a glimpse into the future of uh, what, is, what is possible through this type of technology. Um, you know, when I started doing IoT, it was an interesting jump because when you work in enterprise networking and you're designing campus networks, uh, the networks you think are big and they're very, very critical. You could have you know, you know, hundreds to thousands, even tens of thousands of nodes in your network and you think this is a pretty big network. I have you know, 1,500 branches, I have 10,000 employees in this company, we've got a couple thousand servers. And you know, then you think about IoT, the scale is like on an order, several orders of magnitude bigger. <clears throat> so I often relate it to, you know, like, imagine an architect that's building a house and he's an awesome architect. He's been doing this for his whole career. He's built these beautiful mansions. He's an expert. And then one day the boss walks into the office and he says, great news. We've just won a contract. We're going to build the next Olympic stadium. And he's thinking, well, I, all I've ever built is a house. And now I'm expected to build the Olympic stadium. Well, the architectural experience I have in building a house, I mean, that's good, right? That's useful. But can I really translate it to building the big Olympic stadium? I mean, one of them has, you know, maybe four to eight people might live in it. The next one is for 60,000 people to come and visit. Uh, the building materials are completely different. The use of a stadium is completely different. So you might be so familiar and have expertise in your architecture for the house, but there are certain skills you need to add and certain things you need to learn before you can tackle the big stadium. This is like going from an enterprise network to IoT. Now, there's a lot of folks that work in the service provider market, and of course, they're dealing with very, very large type networks, so they would have those kinds of experiences, but the requirements you see in IoT are not exactly the same as service providers either. You've probably seen a slide something like this in the past, predicting how many devices will be connected to the net, uh, internet uh, by the year 2020, and the prediction is around 50 billion smart objects. Now that's, that's a lot of devices. Uh, now when you look at the T-Mobiles, like we heard Stefan talk this morning, uh, 10 million IPv6 devices, so mobile devices are going to account for a lot of this, but a lot of it is also going to be IoT devices or as John said this morning, Internet of Everything, which Cisco doesn't really use that expression anymore. We went back to just IoT just because people are more familiar with it. But you know how John said this morning that IPv6 is not really about the scalability. It's got to be about making, making it better, making the Internet better. Well, in the world of IoT, it actually is about scalability. So scalability cannot happen with IPv4. It just will not work. When you're looking at a wireless sensor network, uh, a smart meter network, when you're looking at um, precision agriculture where you're dealing with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of nodes, there's no way that IPv4 has the capabilities to scale anywhere close to that. Now, part of the driver, of course, is consolidation of different types of networks. And you know, if we've been around a while, we know about this. Uh, we saw the consolidation of uh, things like voice over IP. So we had vi uh, voice and video phones start to come onto IP networks, get away from the old PBXs, their old separate networks, and they converged right onto IP. Now we don't call IP phones IoT devices. No one ever really thought about calling them that, but in a sense, they kind of are. They're kind of like IoT devices. But as we start to bring more and more types of networks and get rid of these proprietary overlay different systems and bring them onto IP, we start to get much bigger IP networks. And a lot of this is starting to happen with industrial things. So you look at you know, a room like this, it's, it's filled with lights. Uh, there's an HVAC system running in this room. All these are industrial systems that are separate from the enterprise IT network. But the number of devices and, and things you see are actually a lot more than the number of employees and their devices. I did a quick count of the lights in this, this room. So I counted 32 lights. Um, how many uh, Ethernet ports were, are serving this room? Well, there's a couple of access points, so three or four. So the number of lights in this room, if they're connected to a network, is much, much higher than the number of typical Ethernet ports or even perhaps even wireless uh, connectivity. Now, this room is full, but in an average floor space, 
the number of things is going to be much higher than the number of people. Um, <clears throat> an interesting example, so I come from Canada. Um, Cisco's corporate head office is in Toronto. Uh, three years ago, we moved to a new head office in downtown Toronto. So we have four floors. There's about um, four to 500 employees in this office. And they decided to do power over Ethernet lighting in this office. So this is with LED lights. <clears throat> now, I think we're all quite familiar with the advantages of LED lights, right? They last like for 10, 15 years. You don't have to replace tubes and bulbs all the time. They also draw less power, right? So you can actually have less of an electrical bill. Uh, but when you connect them with Ethernet and power over Ethernet, they become intelligent things. And you can start to do interesting things with them. So people kind of walk into an office in, in our Toronto office, and they, there's no light switch. Like, where's, where's the light switch on the wall? Well, you take out your smartphone with an app, and you can control the lighting in the room from an app. Right? So you're changing the mindset and the paradigm a little bit. Um, now, they wanted to do something here to show digital transformation, to show we're, we're thinking differently about the whole infrastructure. Now, you heard the last session in Building 23, how they, they're going IPv6. They mentioned in that session that we're starting to see wireless become the predominant edge of the network. So LAN switching ports are kind of disappearing. Um, already 70 to 80 percent on average are becoming wireless of, of access users. But when you look at the number of Ethernet ports used for lighting, it's like three to six times more than you would use for cubicles. So the number of switching ports you would actually start to use for connected lighting, it actually far exceeds what you would use for cubicles and LAN switching. Now, from a scalability perspective, does it make more sense to do it with V4 or V6? Well, obviously, IPv6 makes way more sense. Uh, so when we started to sell this solution called Digital Ceiling, and it's in partnership with a lot of different companies like Philips and Molex and Cree, um, there's a lot of different you know, ways to do this. But essentially, it's an IPv6 endpoint where you run Slack. Uh, these lights are on their own VLAN. They get their address. They, get, uh, they communicate to the lighting controller through a DNS lookup. It makes it very, very easy to deploy, very rapid. You don't have to worry about the scalability um, of the IP subnet. It works really, really well. So as we see companies start to adopt more and more LED lighting, which has a tremendous cost benefit, it's, it's way cheaper to deploy over time than the um, plenum rated cabling in the ceiling, you can start to take advantage of a very obvious use case for IPv6. In fact, all of our solution guides recommend v6 with Slack as the recommended approach uh, for connected lighting. Now, one of the, I would say, the biggest problem in IoT is something we call the heterogeneity of the sensors and the endpoints. Uh, if you look at all the different types of IoT access methods, there are so many different types from Bluetooth to RFID to um, cellular through 3GPP type technologies, um, things like LoRaWAN, which is starting to become uh, popular, they're all different. Right? They, they all have different types of access method, which means nothing can really talk to each other. So solving this heterogeneous nature of IoT devices is the biggest problem people are trying to solve. So standards committees are trying to address this. And one thought is, well, let's create a services layer. So there's a group called 1M2M, which was pioneered by Etsy. Uh, they really looked and said, let's take the backend application system of all of these, these sensor networks, and let's open up APIs so they can start talking to each other. Well, that's nice, right? It's nice for application layers to be able to talk to each other. But the efficiencies and the scale you can get out of directly communicating devices is so much more if they can talk directly. So IPv6 has the capability, and I'll talk to you, I'll talk a little bit later how we do this, where these devices can actually talk at IPv6, and we can start taking advantage of all of those capabilities, whether it's visibility into the packets, what's happening, uh, manageability through common protocols like co-op, uh, security capabilities, all these things is really the problem we can solve using IPv6. Well, before we do that, we have to look at what is the architecture. If we're familiar with an architecture in an IT enterprise environment, what does the architecture look like when you go to IoT? Well, there is no one hard and fast rule. There is no one 
defined architecture that all IoT must, must look like. There's a lot of different standards organizations which uh, publish their architectures. They have recommendations about IoT structures and it depends on which industry you're in. But um, generally we see that there's a set of requirements which will help define what that architecture is. So let's take a look at what are the requirements of a typical IoT network. Well, very often these are constrained devices. By constrained, it means they have a very uh, low power CPU, they have a small amount of memory, um, they can't push a lot of data. So we're not talking even Raspberry Pis and Arduinos here. These are even smaller, very, very small microprocessors. They can do just a, a little bit of data. So we can't ask them to do a whole lot. Um, the networks that they connect to are also constrained. Uh, if you were to, let's just imagine a city like San Francisco, if you were to IoT enable all of the parking meters, so there could be three to 400,000 parking meters in the city of San Francisco, if you're connecting them and you're IP enabling them, uh, a network that supports three to 400,000 endpoints obviously can become very congested. So the bandwidth for each endpoint is going to be fairly low. So we typically look at IoT networks as lossy and low power type networks. So they're not going to be sending a lot of data, but they do send important data, like there is a car in this spot, or the parking meter has run out. So it's not like a video feed where you're sending high volume of bandwidth, but you're, you're sending important data that reports an important event. So the devices, the networks are constrained, and the scalability is very, very high. Now, they also, in some cases, have deterministic requirements. So what do we mean by deterministic? Uh, if you compare Wi-Fi, for example, Wi-Fi is not deterministic. It's a somewhat best effort. We use a uh, contention mechanism to get access to the media. Well, if I was an autonomous vehicle, right, driving my, my autonomous car down the road, I can't have best effort access to a wireless network. I need deterministic access to the network. I need to have a millisecond response time so that I can drive the car in the, direct, in the correct way. Uh, we know with 5G technologies, we're getting to the capability of very, very high bandwidth with sub one millisecond response times. So these are typical types of requirements that you would never see in IT. Like, like, do you really require deterministic or what we call time sensitive networking capabilities in IT? Well, very rarely. There's you, hard to imagine cases where you need to be truly deterministic. And yet in the IoT world, it's becoming more and more uh, of a requirement whether it's in uh, precision manufacturing, uh, whether it's in utilities that measure the, the current and phase between two substations, it has to be synchronized perfectly. We have these kind of deterministic requirements, but guess what? IPv6 has the capabilities for to do this, and the ITF is working through uh, standards like 6TISH, which allow us to do deterministic networking in IPv6 IoT networks. And also, the security is a little bit different than normal. Uh, if you think about IoT devices, they're publicly accessible. Like if there's a meter, a smart meter on your house, uh, what prevents a crafty hacker from pulling the meter off the wall, uh, trying to open the glass, using a soldering iron, getting into it, and trying to hack into the meter? Well, once you're into the meter, if it's IP connected, you're into the whole network. If you're into the network, you could bring everyone else down. So security has to be at a different level. Uh, there's a common expression in IoT. It says if World War III breaks out, it'll happen in cyberspace first. And I think we all believe that. And if you were to see two nations go to war, to bring down their critical infrastructure would be the easiest thing to do. Uh, if you were to take down a utility and nobody can get power, uh, if you were to attack hospitals and erase patient records, uh, mess with transportation systems so the, the trains stop working. You can almost cripple a country through uh, cybersecurity violations. Well, these are all IoT type of devices. And as they become V6 connected, security is even more paramount than in IT, where the worst thing that can happen is you know, loss of data um, or publishing of private information and, and these types of things. Um, we've even seen in some interesting cases, like you've probably heard the Stuxnet uh, malware that was used uh, to cripple the uh, Iranian uh, uranium 
uh, refiner, refinery where they had these centrifuges that were um, infected with uh, malware that caused the PLC to talk to the, the centrifuge to spin at incredible speeds until it blew it apart. So infections in the IT world are more than just bringing down a system. It actually can create, create physical damage and cause destruction of property. So security is one of the top requirements um, in any IoT in, in deployment. So if we look at architectures for IoT, um, there's many that you could look at, but one of the common ones is the one published by the IoT World Forum, and they've published a reference model. Um, it's, it tends to be quite data management focused, but at the bottom layer you have your, your sensors and your um, actuators. These are the actual physical devices. So these are the things that get your, your v6 address. They connect through a network. Uh, typically, it's a wireless network of some type. It could be a narrowband IoT, low power wireless access, even Wi-Fi. Uh, could be a 15 4G mesh, different types of access methods. But then they connect up to uh, an aggregation point. Um, we often call this the fog computing layer, because as data comes through this, po this um, point of the network, we can start to examine that data and we can perform analytics on it and respond directly back to the physical layer by what we see from this ana analytics. Well, as we move up the stack, we see that the top three, four layers here are really just about managing data. So from a networking perspective, it's, it's less about network, it's more about data. But what I find interesting in this model is if you look at layers four and above, it's really the separation between IT and OT, or the operational technology piece. And what's most interesting about that is this is also the division between IPv6 and IPv4. So you look at a, a company that wants to do a large IoT deployment. And let's say uh, it's, it's sensors along a, a rail line, for example. And this could be a, a large uh, railway system with uh, thousands of miles of track, and they put sensors uh, every mile down the track, for example. You're dealing with a very, very large volume of sensors. Uh, they're going to probably do this with IPv6 for a lot of good reasons, but the organization is typically an IPv4 IT world, right? So we have this division point, this, this boundary, not just between IT and OT, but now between IPv6 and IPv4. Now, when you look at what they do here, a lot of companies are not yet ready to do full IPv6 in the enterprise, so they end up dual stacking a lot of their servers and a lot of their applications at this boundary point and it lets them connect to uh, applications through IPv4, but then the management down the stack will happen with IPv6. So what are some of the challenges with running IPv6 in an IoT world? Well, we know IPv6 is a very feature-rich protocol, but it's also quite a big protocol. Um, it doesn't really suit itself well, as it is, as default, to the IoT world. So a lot of work has been done to adapt IPv6, and especially uh, the v6 headers, to be better suited to IoT. Uh, so we look at the typical stack. What we've created is called an adaptation layer. So this is like a layer 2.5, which really fits between our, our v6 header and our Mac layer that allows us to do what we need to do at IoT, but still taking the advantages of IPv6. Uh, now, this really started with RFC 4944 in something called 6 LOPAN. Uh, this stands for IPv6 for low power uh, wireless personal area networks. And 6 LOPAN was really built to address the problem in a specific wireless mesh technology called 802.15.4. So if you're familiar with 802.15, that's the Zigbee branch, Zigbee family. Now, what I'm talking here is not Zigbee, but it's in that family, so it's, it inherits some of the capabilities of Zigbee. But 802.15.4 networks were really the first to be used on large scale for smart meter networks, and they're a mesh-type network. So you can have a couple thousand nodes form a mesh uh, talking to each other, and they connect to each other up to an aggregation point. Now, when the spec was published, um, the MAC layer was defined as 127 bytes. Now you look at the IPv6 MTU, it's 1280, right? So this is a, it's a big packet. How do we fit it into 127 bytes? Well, do we like fragmentation and reassembly in IPv6? No, <laughs> but it's not gonna work without it, right? So 
to squeeze a V6 packet into um, an IoT frame, in this case, uh, 802.15.4e frame, we have to do some adaptation. So the first thing we do is we create um, compression. So we take the IPv6 header, which is very big. So we've got um, up to 60 bytes of header with extension headers and things like that. And we compress it. And then secondly, we create something called fraglets. So this is basically just fragmentation and reassembly, but it's limited in the world of, in the access network of the IoT system. Uh, so let's take a look at an example here. So here's an 802.15.4 header without compression on the top, without six low pan. So as you can see, the entire frame is 127 bytes, right? So we put in our IPv6 header. Uh, this is 40 bytes without an extension header. It only leaves us like 53 bytes of payload. So your efficiency of transmitting this through your IoT network is going to be extremely low because you're not sending a lot of data. Uh, these, these frames are small. You need to actually get your data through if, as efficiently as you can. Um, now, 53 bytes is, of course, very inefficient. Now, adding six low pan, it allows us to compress the header down to approximately two bytes, and we can greatly increase the payload up to 108 bytes. So our efficiency of transmission across 802.15.4 goes up dramatically. Now, later on, the spec was actually modified to allow uh, 2,000 byte frames. Now, no vendor has actually implemented the larger frame size. Why do you think they prefer to have such small frame sizes? They're lossy networks, exactly. These are extremely lossy networks, right? Uh, they're using typically unlicensed spectrum, so you have interference from uh, different sources. Uh, they use a frequency hopping spread spectrum, so they're bouncing all over the place trying to get into sequence, and you're going to lose a lot of frames. Now, if you send big frames, if you, have, uh, if, you, if you lose it and you don't get an acknowledgement, you have to resend. Now, if it's a big fat frame with a lot of data in it, the efficiency goes way down. You can actually achieve better efficiency with smaller frames than you can with big ones on a lossy network. So that's why we see the, real, the industry adopting smaller frame sizes. What about power consumption? You're sending more and more packets. Right, but you're, you're transmitting less. They're smaller. And by the way, 802.15.4 is typically used for uh, continuously electrically powered devices. Um, there's a different type of class, like the uh, narrowband IOTs, the uh, LPWAs. Those are typically battery powered. And those are very, very sensitive to how much data you send. And those have even a, a, a smaller footprint. Yeah. Uh, so 6 low pan was really first initiated for 802.15.4 networks. But as people started to deploy them, they see this is extremely useful. We should actually start to add uh, this type of adaptation layer to a whole host of other IoT technologies, uh, whether it's Bluetooth, BLE, uh, DECnet, uh, power, um, power line carrier, all these different uh, access methods started to inherit the same kind of capabilities. So as of today, uh, BLE has actually finished its RFC. So 7668 uh, has been published. The other ones are um, in the works. They're in process. I think an interesting one here is uh, BACnet. Is anyone familiar with BACnet? couple of people. I'll just tell you about BACnet for a minute. If you look at a building like this, uh, the HVAC system communicates on something called BACnet. So your temperature controls, your CO2 levels, all that within a building, it's all controlled through the BACnet system. So as the temperature starts to go up or, or down in a room, it communicates to something called your building management system or your BMS, and it changes the airflow into an HVAC zone. So this is done typically over Ethernet today using BACnet. Again, you're looking at a separate network that's not part of your regular IT network. Well, there's a lot of effort to bring BACnet into, consolidate it into the IT domain. And it makes sense because your temperature, uh, your thermometer on your wall, it may have a different type of technology. It might be a Wi-Fi connected uh, thermostat. Why do you have to use one that's physically connected into the BACnet system? Isn't it easy to just have a Wi-Fi connected one or a LPWA type connected one? Well, that's when IPv6 makes a lot of sense because now you're starting to converge onto one type of protocol. Now, routing is also an interesting issue in IoT. 
when you're looking at vast scale of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of devices, the traditional types of routing protocols start to break. Uh, so a tremendous amount of effort was done to look at existing routing protocols and think about do they really meet the requirements of large-scale IoT networks? Um, if you look at what you know, existing I, uh, routed, routing protocols do, um, like OSPF or ISIS or BGP, um, they're not really well suited to lossy networks. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, link state protocols like OSPF, uh, what happens when the interface goes down and bounces back up? Right? You flood LSAs and then every router has to respin its SPF table. Uh, imagine you're on a very lossy network where all the interfaces are going up and down thousands per minute. Imagine how many LSAs you'd be flooding. It just does not work. Link state protocols do not typically work in high scale uh, IoT environments. Um, a lot of analysis was done for, um, uh, for BGP, for even EIGRP and other protocols that are lesser known. At the end of the day, it was decided that none of the protocols out there are really well suited to IoT. And a new one was developed called Ripple, or the um, routing for low, po low power lossy networks. And this is defined in RFC 6550. Now, it's a very interesting protocol because it's a distance vector protocol, so it's not link state, but it uses something that other protocols don't have, and that is a flexible objective function. It means you can change the behavior of the routing protocol depending on the requirements you want to give to it. So you want to give it a requirement like how many hops to go or something else, you can start to change that type of uh, metric. Uh, so let's start with a few definitions and I'll give you examples of how Ripple actually works in an IoT environment. Uh, so Ripple uses something called, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> called a DAG or a directed acyclic graph. Uh, a directed acyclic graph means you have nodes here on the bottom, these lighter colored ones, and they're trying to connect to um, a root node of some kind. Well, in a sensor network, you're typically trying to hit one sensor, which we call the root. So it's a direction-oriented DAG, so we call it a DODAG. Uh, so it has kind of unusual names, but it's, it's a very common mathematical construct used in uh, a lot of different um, uh, scenarios. So if you take the concept of a DODAG and you look at an actual network. So here we see there's a, uh, there's a router there at the top. That's our root, root, root node. We call this rank zero. And every level below it uh, increases the rank by one. So the first level is a rank one, then rank two, then rank three. And as these devices start to join this layer three mesh network, they talk to each other and they discover what level they're at in the network. And they do this by communicating through the whole network. Now, routing is important. The goal of a sensor is to report information back up into the cloud. So to do that, he has to find the optimal path through the cloud. So the router at rank zero uh, passes something called the DIO message. Think of it as a default route advertisement. He passes his default route down to all the different sensors in the mesh, and they find what is the best path up into the route. And this helps with loop prevention and so on. Now, if devices have to communicate with each other, uh, they need to know about each other's IP address as well. So they actually have a DAG advertisement object or DAO message. So everyone learns basically the topology within the network. Now, we're talking layer three here. Right? This, is, this is all a flat layer two network. All these sensors are flat layer two, but they all carry a different IP address and they're actually building a routing layer even though they are flat. You can think of it as, it's like one VLAN, but it's not Ethernet, right? This is 802.15.4. They're finding the best path, building the layer three layer on top of uh, the layer two. Now, the objective function is probably the coolest thing about Ripple. Um, so I can route on something called expected transmission, which is really a, a measurement of how reliable my link, link is. For example, if I was to send you five packets and you send me back five, I would say that's a very reliable link and you get a value of one. That's great. If I send you five packets and you send me back two, then your value is going to be like three, which is, means it's not a very good metric. Um, we can change it and say hop count is more important. Or I can say the, the latency is important. Or how about the energy consumed on that device? Uh, the question was brought up about battery-powered devices. 
So what if some of these are electrically powered devices, but some of them are battery powered? Okay, so battery powered device, every time I transmit, it's consuming the energy and it's draining that battery. And if I want these batteries to last like five to 10 years, that means I can't be transmitting every few minutes. I have to preserve my battery as long as I can. So let's take an example here of a very small little mesh network that's being formed. So we've got, um, let me go over here, walk over here. So, so we've got our root node here, and we've got two sensors that are already attached to the network. So they've got their IPv6 address, and they're going to use ETX, so link reliability, as their objective function. Now, both of them have very good reliable links, so they've got an ETX value of one. Now, let's say this new sensor shows up here, and he wants to uh, connect into this mesh network. What is the optimal routing path through this network? Well, if you look at it, he's got three options, right? He can go to the branch on the left, he can go directly up to the root, or he can take the branch on the right. Well, to figure it out, he's going to have to start probing to see which is the better path. So he starts probing using packets to see what is the best ETX. And he discovers that the ETX on the left is 1, the middle is 3, and a 1.5 on the right-hand side. Now, what we want is the lowest overall path, like a distance vector protocol, right? So we want the overall lowest path. And the lowest path uh, here is 2 on the left, 3 down the middle, and 2.5 on the right. So what he's going to do is choose the path on the left, and this is now his routing topology in this mesh network. Now, one of the cool things about Ripple is that because it's lossy, he knows that I may lose this link on the left. He always keeps a backup link ready. So this parent on the right is sort of his backup path in case he loses one on the left. So he can reestablish his routing very, very quickly. So how big do these networks get? How many nodes can we have in a Ripple mesh network? Thousands. So in real deployments, and I'll show you an example in a few minutes of an actual deployment, uh, we have some mesh networks with 3,000 nodes in it. Uh, the spec goes as high as 5,000. But you can literally have thousands and thousands of nodes in a network like this. Uh, let's just take one other little quick example here. Uh, let's say we have a mesh network, a little bit bigger this time. So we've got a mesh network built like this, and we've got this node on the bottom left here with a circle around it. Uh, what's his best path through the network? Well, let's say day one, we're just going to very simply use your routing uh, metric, your objective function is your lowest ETX. So adding up all the ETXs to the root, it seems like the fastest one is just take this branch on the left. But do you notice there is one of the nodes here that's got a circle around it? That's a battery powered node. Okay. Now if I continuously route through my battery powered node, he's going to drain the power very quickly and he'll be off the network. So let's say I, I change my objective function a little bit now. So let's say I'm going to change it where route through only high powered nodes or electrically continuously powered nodes as my first objective function. And then secondly is ETX. Well, the routing now becomes very different. He's going to choose a path like this, bypassing the battery powered node at all costs. Now, if there was no other option, he would have to go through the battery powered node. But this is really cool. This shows you that we can now change the behavior of a routing protocol basically on any metric we want. And it might be what kind of sensor we have, if it's a smart meter or if it's some other type of actuator. We can start to adapt it and craft how our routing protocol begins to work. Um, here's an example from a Cisco router. I just wanted to show you this because the router needs to understand the Ripple tree. So this has only got a few nodes in it. But as you can see, the router has to actually start to sort all the V6 nodes into uh, the tree. So you see here's the rank 0 at the top. That's the router himself. Below it, he's got a couple of rank 1s. Then he's got rank 2s, which sit below it. So this is the tree. This is the path through the network. And then the sensors as well have to have a similar table because they need to know which path to take up through the network. Make sense? OK. Now, one of the interesting challenges with IoT is you can't just rip and replace everything and go IPv6. Uh, there's a lot of legacy gear out there. Um, if you look at utilities, for example, they have 
they have so much stuff up on their utility poles. They've been up there for like 10 to 50 and sometimes 20 years. And they don't want to start replacing all their stuff just because you've got this great fancy mesh network and you can do IPv6 now. They say, you know, I want to have my device connected into your mesh and have, have uh, management of it, but I don't want to have to replace it. So one of the key capabilities here is to be able to um, support legacy devices through a gateway device. Now, <coughs> there's various types of gateway devices you could have, but these devices will typically connect through a, through a serial connection or an IPv4 type connection or something like that. Now, it's, it's actually interesting uh, working with some utilities that I've, I've worked a lot with. Uh, they have these things up on poles that um, were kind of built to be smart devices. They thought they'd never have a network connection to these things because they're so remote. So they were built to have autonomous intelligence without any management. But if you give them the ability to connect to it through a network, then they're going to love it. Uh, the typical protocol they use for communication is uh, SCADA, very old protocol, very insecure protocol, like 30 years old. It was never built with IP in mind. It was typically a serial protocol. Uh, eventually, it got really high tech and went IPv4. But no one ever thought these devices are ever going to be connected to an actual network. So they actually left all their IPv4 uh, configuration default. So it's like every single device, tens of thousands of them, has 192.168.0.1. So this is what you face when you start to bring these things onto the network. You've got a lot of devices with all the same IP address. So let's take an example here where you have a, a device on the left. This is a, let's say it's a, um, uh, let's say it's a capacitor bank up on a pole, and they want to connect to it through their application server, which is running SCADA. Well. We need to actually traverse now our IPv6 network to get to it. So you've got IPv4 on the left, you've got IPv4 on the right. We need to go through a mapping, so typically a, a NAT64 type of a scenario, to be able to connect to that device. So if we look at the, the protocols and how it's stacked up, the goal is end-to-end -end SCADA, right, between the device and the application server. We know we've got six low pan there on our mesh network, and we've got IPv6. Um, from the, the mesh endpoint up into the border router. Now, you've got IPv4 natively between the end device and the application server. Now, to connect it all, we use a protocol called MAPT. So if you're familiar with MAPT, it's basically, um, let me just go back for a sec. Yeah, there is RFC, I forgot the number. RFC 7599 defines MAPT. It's basically a stateless NAT64 on both ends. Build this out again. So if you look at a you know, sample scenario, we have our SCADA server here. It's 10.1.0.60, and he's communicating to 192.168.0.2 on the left. And just imagine that you've got 1,000 devices all with the same IPv4 address. It means that I need to uh, do a NAT64, so it's, it's running MAPT. So basically, I'm taking my uh, decimal address here. I'm converting it to hex. It goes into the IPv6 address, as you can see there, the source and destination. It traverses the whole v6 network. It gets converted back to v4 at my gateway router. And now I need to do a NAT44 because all the devices have the same address. I do this, and now I've been able to connect IPv4 devices on massive scale across my network that's running v6 in the middle. So with tools like MAPT, and we have customers that are running this today, it allows them to start bringing on those, those old devices they thought they would never actually be able to connect to. So I want to give you, uh, just before we wrap up, and I know I'm the only thing standing between you and a beer, so <clears throat> I want to give you just an example of, of how we've deployed some of this with a real customer. Uh, one customer I've worked a lot with for almost six years since we started this project is BC Hydro. Uh, so where is BC Hydro? If you get in your car and you drive 800 miles straight north, you'll hit the Canadian border and it will start snowing, and your money will be worth a lot more, and you'll be in a place called Vancouver. And that's uh, basically where the head office of uh, BC Hydro is. Now, BC Hydro covers all of the province of British Columbia. And from a size perspective, it's like combining California, Oregon, and Washington State together is their serving area. But there's only like 4.5 million people in the whole province. Uh, the number of customers they have is around uh, 2 million. 
So they started a project back in 2012 to convert all of their meters to uh, smart meters. And they really wanted to do this with IPv6 because that would let them use it for multi-purpose. They didn't want to go and build an advanced meter network only to talk to meters. They wanted to be able to talk to EV recharging stations and to street lights and to uh, distribution automation types of devices and have it as a real multi-grid, multi-service type of network. And again, this is, the, this is the story of IPv6, right? That all of these heterogeneous types of sensors and types of devices can talk and share a common network infrastructure that we're consolidating these together. So this is the, typically the network we would design for a uh, smart grid or smart meter network. And although I'm talking about BC Hydro, this has been done many times over and over again across the US, uh, in Canada, in South America, into Asia. It's really becoming, uh, I would say, a standard for how to deploy a uh, smart grid. And smart grid, by the way, is a, probably a term you've heard a lot before. And it's defined differently depending on who you talk to. Uh, but smart grid is basically intelligent devices at the edge which can control the flow of electricity. Right? And that's how we can do this through intelligent communications. Now, this device at the top, that root node, that rank zero in the ripple tree, um, we have a product called the, the grid router. I mean, other companies would have something similar. Uh, I, just, I like this picture because uh, the one on the left is actually like two blocks from my house. And the other one on the right is my friend who lives in Rio de Janeiro. And I just like to show how the Canadian wiring system is very clean and it's <laughs> very tidy. And I, I always tease him about, I don't know what's going on in Rio, but it's, it's a mess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. So, so in, in the urban area, this router here, the white one on the pole, um, it's got these little dongles hanging down from it. That's, that's the 802.15.4 mesh network. Um, there's up to 3,000 uh, nodes in a single mesh in the denser areas in the city. Um, for example, uh, sorry, back it up. Uh, in the farm communities, in distant areas, maybe just a couple hundred meters. But it's really designed to be uh, as dense as possible. And you know what we found is the denser the mesh, the better it gets. Because you have more options to route through. If you have a small uh, mesh network with just a couple hundred nodes, uh, the choices for optimal routing become less and less. <coughs> In a typical Ethernet uh, VLAN environment, we don't want to have very big VLANs. We want to have fairly controlled size to, to limit the broadcast to storms and things like that. It's really the opposite in a mesh network. We want to have more and more devices. It strengthens the mesh. Uh, it makes it better and more reliable. Uh, now, let's take a look at a smart meter here. On the top is the, uh, there's, there's three different boards here to pay attention to. The top is the, uh, the fan radio. So this actually carries the IPv6 stack. So the entire stack and the 15 4G stack is sitting on the top radio. Um, in the middle is a board that talks Zigbee into the house. So there's something called the home area network. So now there's appliances like washing machines. Your, uh, if you have a, a hot water heater that happens to be electrically controlled, these can now communicate through Zigbee and give you information and feedback about the electrical use of your appliances. So there's a radio pointing inwards. And then behind it is something called the metrology board, which actually uh, measures the electrical usage and it lets you um, get information about how much you're using. So this is a, an example of an underground vault in an apartment building. So this is, I mean, this looks like a, a nice meter farm here. But when you see this, what should you be thinking? Is this just a bunch of meters? This, this is, this is an IPv6 network. And it's powered. These are powered, yeah. But, but these are more than IPv6 endpoints. These are routers. They're all running Ripple, right? They're not just an endpoint with a default gateway. They're actually carrying a routing table, making decisions among themselves, who to route to, how to get to the next hop up to the route. So I like to ask people, what's the most deployed routing protocol in the world? You know, they always say it's like BGP or OSPF or something. And while it's true, there's a lot of that out there, right? H hundreds of thousands, maybe. Um, a network like this, where we have deployed 2 million, that's 2 million routers running Ripple. I think SS7 has a beat. What's that? SS7 probably has a beat. SS7, I've heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, as, you know, when you look at, I mean, this is a very small smart meter deployment. Um, there's much bigger ones that are coming. Um, TEPCO in Japan is planning 27 million meter uh, rollout. Um, in California, there's a lot of work with um, the big utilities here. Um, um, Duke Energy is doing massive deployments. When you look at every single endpoint is actually a Ripple router now. Ripple very quickly becomes the most deployed routing protocol in the world. Um, now, the cool thing about smart meters, of course, is you can start to collect information about your home power consumption. So you can get your, um, this is actually from my house, so you can see how much power I'm using. So you can see on a daily basis, you can see on an hourly basis, and you can even see even each appliance how much it's consuming. And the utility can start to do things like uh, time of day based billing and different activities like that. Uh, now, how do you address a network of this size? Now, we had a great presentation from uh, Tom this morning uh, about uh, the IPv6 uh, routing plan and, and address management. You know, obviously, you have three options. You can manually configure things, which is a really bad idea. Um, you could use Slack. Well, Slack works in some environments, like you know, ceiling, like we talked about. But it doesn't work so well in a massive smart meter type network or other wireless sensor network. And part of the reason is you also have to hand off whole prefixes for other subnets sitting behind. So if we look at um, the types of addresses we're using here in a large scale smart meter network, these red things are IPsec tunnels. So we have VPN tunnels between these grid routers and the, uh, the uh, core, which sits back in a data center or in a, in a cloud somewhere. Uh, these could go over LTE, 3G, satellite, WiMAX. Um, in fact, in the case of BC Hydro, um, the, uh, they partnered with uh, TELUS and with Rogers to uh, connect these. We need to have a slash 64 on these tunnels. So there's a whole prefix that needs to be assigned dynamically as these grid routers are put on. We have the addressing of the mesh. Uh, then we have the actual addressing of the home area network sitting behind. So you have multiple slash 64s that need to be deployed more than just uh, stateless addresses. So Slack is really not an option when you look at these types of environments. Uh, the other thing we need is something we call option 17, which is a field inside the DHCP um, offer, which identifies the IP address of the network management system. So as these meters come on, they're all zero touch. They, they register themselves with their meter management system or their uh, IoT network management system. And to find that network management system, we embed the IP address of it into the DHCP offer. So these kind of requirements really, I think, force the decision to go with uh, stateful DHCP v6. And in fact, they used InfoBlox and uh, helped uh, get a lot of help from InfoBlox to deploy this type of a system. So just to, to summarize, uh, they went to Aaron, got a slash 36. And, and they thought, well, you know, we're going to deploy this for the mesh network for IoT, but conceivably one day we may actually use IPv6 in the enterprise and the data center as well. So they actually created a v6 addressing plan for the entire network. Um, so they started to carve up slash 40s, one for data center, one for uh, the enterprise network, um, a lot of them for future use, and so on. Um, in this example, I just simplified it a lot without revealing too much. But as you can see, there's a slash 40 for the wide area network. So this is the, the tunnels that go down to all these grid routers. Uh, below is the mesh network. Um, this is Cisco mesh, but actually it's open standard. This is nothing proprietary about this mesh. Um, it's just they worked with us when they deployed it. And then each, each mesh itself um, from these grid routers, each ripple tree gets a slash 64. And then beyond that, the home area network also gets a slash 64. Now, what was interesting is when this first went up, they, they wanted to deploy this in 2013. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't quite ready with our IPv6 stack and implementation. We still had about nine months of work to do to finish coding this. Uh, to meet the timeline and the contract, they actually went ahead and started to deploy this uh, right away with their meter partner. So they put the Cisco routers up on poles, but they used the proprietary mesh uh, mechanism from the meter partner, which was uh, iTron. And they, they deployed it, and they actually had all two million meters fully deployed using a proprietary technology. So there was no IP addresses on these things even. It was a pure layer two connection from the meter to the router, and then would have a, an IPsec backhaul. Well, 
in 2015, they decided to convert this then to IPv6 because we were finally ready for them. Now this was an exciting day. They needed to push out the software, so they used multicast to push out the software update to all the meters. And we didn't want to do the entire network at one point. Uh, I was kind of chuckling when they were talking about Building 23, and no offense to my colleagues in Building 23, when they went away for Christmas and came back and there was like 500 um, addresses switched over to V6. Uh, our first switch over was a quarter million. So in one day, we pressed the big magic button to convert a quarter million meters from proprietary ITRON network connection to IPv6. And it was like, you know, they did it and everyone's waiting. And you're waiting and nothing happens, of course, because it takes a long time for software to upgrade and the mesh to reform. But within a couple hours, all the mesh started to come back and it started to form. And it worked so well that a month later they did another quarter million and then we finished off in August of 2016 of um, the last 650,000 meters in one shot. And the results to me is like this is the triumph of IPv6. Uh, look at the results of how the mesh behaved and formed prior to v6 to after. So in the prior case, proprietary case, we had some meters that were 30 levels deep. So imagine a mesh where you're going that deep and how long it takes to get down there. Once it converted to v6, um, the maximum depth was 14 levels, which is still pretty deep, but 60% of the meters were now within three hops of the route. This mesh became so much flatter and so much faster. Uh, from a performance perspective, you look at the, the time it would take to get between hops. Um, point you down to this number here. The average difference between hops is 1.7 seconds before IPv6. Afterwards, it went to 280 milliseconds. So our performance difference in going to v6 was like, this is what we've been saying all along. Like, this, this is why you should be going v6. And I mean, this is still, I would say, early days of the technology. There's a lot of advancement that the standard bodies are working on now to actually take this to a much, much faster performing mesh. We're, you know, years ahead, we're going to see uh, much, much faster connections and much higher bandwidth to these types of devices. So what we're working on now, it's uh, making this into a multi-service network. Uh, there's something called demand response. Uh, in electrical grids, power balance is the most important thing. Your power production has to meet demand. If your power production is too high, you have to start shedding power. If you don't have enough, you start to get brownouts. So balance of power is the most critical thing in the electrical grid. Well, what happens during peak power times, like during the hot summer, when everyone's got the air conditioning unit on? Or in the cold winter, when people got more, more heat pouring in? Well, there's things they've been developed called demand response. So you can attach a device like this to appliances or to devices in a home that may not be as critical, and you can actually shut them off to balance out the power. So they've actually deployed uh, demand response systems on the same mesh network to several hundred uh, pilot customers that were consuming simply too much power during peak periods. Additionally, streetlights. Uh, BC Hydro owns 100,000 streetlights that are on their poles. And they've started to deploy streetlights onto the same mesh network. There's two big benefits for this. Number one is you start to get control of your lights. So you, you know when it's burned out. You can change the time schedule of when the lights are on and things like that. But their secret real agenda is that putting this onto the streetlight strengthens the mesh. Do you remember I said the more number of nodes you have in a mesh, the better it gets? The more routing options you have, the faster it gets? So by putting these out on the street, that's kind of up above the houses, you can connect to way more meters within the mesh network. So this is uh, sort of where we're going, but I think there'll be way more applications uh, coming in the near future. And I think that's it for me. All right. Yeah, questions? Uh, do you want a microphone? Um, I'm curious whether you have experienced any outage of this network or any hacking. Uh, so the question is whether there's been an uh, outage. So there has been um, power outages because of, of uh, weather. So we've had storms which actually knocked out um, power to homes. And let's say we lose uh, 50,000 homes, lose the power. When you lose the power to the homes, you lose the meters, which means you lose the network. 
uh, when the power gets restored, that net mesh network needs to reform. Um, we found that the, re the reformation of the mesh sometimes takes longer than we expected. Um, there is a time it takes to reform the ripple um, adjacencies to find the optimal path through the network. So I think the, the worst cases we've seen have been weather situations. And one of the areas we're working on now is to find ways to have faster recovery of the mesh. So when the power comes back on, we can quickly reform it instead of waiting you know, 45 minutes to get connectivity back to these, these endpoints. So that's the worst outage we've had so far. Any hacking? Any what? Hacking. People try to get into your Any network. hacking? Yeah. Any hacking. You know, I, I really wanted to add a bunch of security slides to this, uh, this case study. And actually, um, uh, if you, I can talk to you later about it. There's a, there's a hidden slide here about security. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of work that went into securing the system. So we use link level encryption, uh, so AES encryption. There's a certificate that's on every single meter and every single grid router. Um, the encryption keys are kept on a, a HSM, so high security module, which is kept separate from the network. Um, there's been no reports of hacking, uh, so that doesn't mean there hasn't been. But we feel very confident that it's about as secure as you could possibly make it um, at this point in time. Any other questions? Yeah. As a BC Hydro customer, I, li I live in Victoria, BC. Oh, I'm, I'm going to start looking for those white boxes. <laughs> um, earlier in your presentation, you said that IoT devices were memory constrained, but yet you've got these, these ripple networks of a lot of nodes. Can you give us an idea of how much memory that requires just to run a 3,000 node ripple network? Uh, so how much memory is actually being consumed? Um, or, or how much memory these devices have if they're quote unquote memory constrained? Uh, to, to be honest, I can't recall off the top of my head how much memory is on these meters. Uh, and it, it, it actually varies depending on what kind of meter you have. I think what's important to note is that there, there's different types of IoT devices. Um, these ones here where it's, it's an expensive meter that goes into a home, they tend to have a little more memory and compute than you would have in, for example, um, a sensor that's in a, in a parking meter, right? That has to be battery powered. Or uh, another case is uh, garbage cans. People are starting to put wireless sensors into garbage cans to know when they fill up so they can send a signal to the truck to come in and dump it, right? Those are very low power type devices that spend most of their life sleeping. And they don't consume much, much power and they're, they need to be very, very constrained. So it really depends on what type of, uh, of a network you're looking at. Uh, the, big, um, the big story these days is about narrowband IoT and LoRa. People call this as the VHS versus beta type of you know, you know, battle where you have two competing standards. These are all extremely constrained devices um, where you have, uh, they'll spend most of their life asleep until they need to wake up and actually transmit some, some information. So I, I guess I'm still, sorry to push you a little bit on this, but are sure. we talking a megabyte? Are we talking, you know, like, like uh, an Arduino that has 32K on it? I'm just kind of curious, scale of memory. I, to be honest, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Okay, I have to I'll, I'll, I'll ping you about it later. All over the map, but some of the devices in the sensor realm that he's talking about may have as little as 4K. Yeah, I guess I was mostly concerned about the Ripple and, and being able to manage all those tables. The ripple and the things that are going to be doing things like Ripple is probably more in the 512K and up realm. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Because you never need more than 640, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was just wondering, some of the earlier work that I had been doing with Schumler, Schlumberger on, on the meters used, uh, you know, the power lines as their communications media, is that a possibility for a backup or is that totally not in the question with the, the new configurations? Yeah, so, so a good question about power line carrier. So um, this is 1901.2 stuff. So this is actually, I think, very common in Europe where they have... Um, the spectrum is much more reduced and you, you have transformers in the way. Right. So we see a power line carrier being uh, much more common there. Uh, what we're looking at and what the, um, so, so the standard body that runs this is the Y-Sun Alliance. Uh, and power line carrier was um, owned by the Home Plug Alliance and Netricity. And what has happened in the last six months is um, Home Plug has divested Netricity and they've merged with Y-Sun. So Y-Sun the, are the people that owns the field area network stack for all the Ripple, for six low pan, all this. Uh, they've now m amalgamated with uh, Netricity. So the 1901 PLC is merging with the, um, the wireless fan stuff you see here. And what we really want to see is 
is multi-hop routing. So imagine a situation where I need to go to an underground vault where I can't get RF into. Right. So imagine I go PLC from my router down to, the, down to a, a node, and from there I recreate the mesh into the, into the meter farm in that underground vault. So combining PLC and RF mesh together is really the panacea, and we're hoping that's where Ysun will be taking us in the future. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I got a question that may be forward leaning. Would you see application to reduce uh, memory requirements, uh, perhaps using named data networks in a in a mesh network, or as opposed to, and then connect to IPv6? If if you're familiar with the named data networks, uh, named data networks, no, sorry. Um, it's basically a naming paradigm, uh, as opposed to an address paradigm. And uh, I, oh, okay. I know it's being invested in, in around the industry, but uh, um, yeah, it's a good question. I'm I'm quite like connected in with the IoT industry, and I haven't heard a lot of talk about that. Um, I'd like to learn more about. That, so, thanks. Well, well I'll catch you a little bit. Thanks. Okay. I, in line with the previous question, it's conceivable that in a in a city there might be overlapping mesh from other providers. How is spectrum managed? Okay, so how is spectrum managed? That's one of the most challenging problems. Um, you have, in the ISM band, you have uh, North America, you're, you're at the um, uh, 900 megahertz, so, so 915 megahertz, say, and it's a very limited spectrum that's shared among other things. Uh, I've seen a lot of talk in the old days, people said, let's do this with Wi-Fi. Right? Well, Wi-Fi has uh, fairly wide channels, 20 megahertz channels, and you've only got three of them. Um, it really would not work very well in scale. How this works with um, 802.15.4 is it uses frequency hopping. So we have 64 channels with a pseudo-random pseudo frequency hopping schedule. So two adjacent nodes will create their own frequency hopping sequence, which will be different from another two adjacent nodes. This makes it uh, deal with interference very, very well because if interference is found to be on a certain channel where it's hopping, it will avoid those channels and try to um, isolate itself to the channels with less interference. Uh, so we found that with frequency hopping spread spectrum, you're able to actually perform this mesh, get this mesh to perform very well, um, even in the um, presence of some RF interference. If you have a huge amount, of course, it's, it's going to be problematic. And there has been cases where there's really no choice but to put an LTE module onto that meter. But that's extremely rare. That's like less than 1% of the situation. Uh, we found over five years of, of deployment that uh, this mechanism works very, very well. So I'm wondering if you could explain how Cisco's work and Cable Lab's work and the Open Connectivity Foundation fits into this picture. Uh, so how Cisco's work with... So OCF is, a, is an organization that is dealing with standardization in the IPv6 and IoT mm -hmm. space. Is there any? I mean, specific, aware of that or not, specific or? to? Are you asking specifically to um, the things with Ripple or with it just in general? Standards in general. Um, I, to be honest, I'm not a, terribly involved with the standards committees. Um, I'm probably not the right person to ask. Okay. So. Fair enough. Um, although I, I will say that the only uh, religion we have at Cisco is you know, to drive standards into all of these things. And where there weren't standards, um, we're playing a very active role. Uh, for example, the uh, Ripple protocol was uh, designed by a Cisco fellow named uh, JP Vasur, and uh, it was driven through the IETF, uh, same as things like uh, deterministic network th networking with Sixtish. Uh, all of these things are being, I think, championed, uh, or at least partially championed by Cisco. Yeah. So I was curious if you had any thoughts about what's going on with the HomeNet group with Mark Townsley and what they're trying to work on with DHCP v6 PD and if any of that's extending into what you're seeing around your work. Uh, yeah, so I'm familiar with that. It's, it, I wouldn't say there's a, a direct connection. Um, what should I say? I don't really think that, at least at this point, there hasn't been a, a you know, direct um, impact from, from those types of things with the, the IoT you know, V6 efforts, um, probably over time we'll see more of it. Um, is there something specific you're looking at or? 
I was sort of curious because, you know, uh, Google Nest, right, doing V6 on the internal side, they're, they're gatewaying off, so they have home net requirements to get V6 back to them to expose what they're doing behind, behind their systems. It obviously is the next extension into what we would like to have in terms of what, you yeah. know, direct, direct capabilities to drive against, against what's happening in, 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 in sort of the area that you're building. So it's, it, it, it seems to be lining up, but there doesn't seem to be like the standards are lining up yeah, I mean, very well. I mean, so far, things like, like Google Nest and, and what we're doing are, are a little bit like running in parallel. Right, two ships in the uh, You know, we, we, are, we are advertising V6 into the home area network for certain things, but it's not really <coughs> connecting with the intelligent home network that, that Google's working on. There's been, I think, very little conversation as far as I've seen in that space. Um, hopefully there will be more as, you know, there's consumer IoT and then there's industrial IoT. Uh, Cisco's focus has been, to be honest, much more on the industrial IoT side, so working with the utility to develop smart grid. And then the home network piece has is, is been a little bit, you know, yes, we'll support it to a point, but not, um, not like what Google Nest is doing. What's the typical lifespan of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, what's the typical lifespan of, um, of a smart meter and of the components around that? So lifespan of a smart meter, it depends. Uh, it was funny when we were going through this project, they were pulling out meters that actually had been deployed in like 1935 and had been rusted out for decades and nobody even knew how to charge these, these customers. So they're just getting a bill and estimating what their, <laughs> what their bill would be. Um, the typical, I mean, the typical lifespan, um, it depends which utility you, know, you talk to. Uh, you hear 20 to 30 years is the typical lifespan that they want to achieve. Um, if it wasn't uh, an IP connected type of, of device, that would be more problematic because you could never update the software. Uh, the nice thing with IP connectivity is that you can do software upgrades to these things and you can uh, enable more capabilities until you run out of you know, memory and CPU. Will we be seeing uh, like some Cisco switches that will have a 30 year lifespan as well? <laughs> Again, I'm not the right person to talk to. <laughs> Someone from engineering was here. <laughs> I was just curious if uh, I used to work with a company called Metricom a long time ago that did something similar, but it wasn't IP based. I was wondering how much of that, if you were, if you were aware of them, and how much of that technology from 2001 maybe made its way up into here, or, or was that the the software that was already running on some of the other ones? That you so, so no, it through? wasn't uh, Metricom. It was uh, Itron. So uh, until now, all of the different meter, smart meter type vendors, which to be honest, have really been the leading edge of, of IoT at scale. Uh, they all had their own proprietary type of uh, implementations. And it was hard because you could never interoperate one with the other. The advantage of going open standards um, is that you can start to interoperate. You don't have to have a Cisco router to talk to a meter that runs a Cisco protocol stack. It should be like Wi-Fi, where you have anybody's AP can talk to anybody's, anybody's NIC card. Uh, so about five years ago, we started uh, working with, directly with our competitors to um, standardize this, and that's where Ysun came. So I'm not sure exactly if you know your former company was contributing any technology to Ysun. I don't think they're part of Ysun, at least. Yeah, I don't think so. That fo it folded, and uh, but it was bought out and sold by multiple other companies, and uh, I yeah. still see those pole top antennas all over the place. But I don't know if anybody's used I don't think they're being used. So. Yeah. Okay. Many of the systems you talked about were or relied on mechanical ways of measuring the data and making it really reliable and then confident that that's what it was. Now that we're going to more digitiza digitization of this data, how do we guarantee its, its uh, reliability or its integrity that what I'm getting billed is what I'm getting billed uh, in that context? I mean, how do you guarantee the reliability that a meter read is accurate? Yeah. I, I mean, I guess there has to be a certain trust, right, between <laughs> the, uh, the customer and the, the utility. Um, I would think that you at least have an audit trail, right? You have a meter read happening, passing through the network, being stored into a database, and then you can actually produce that record. Uh, compare that to the old days where you had these um, university students on their summer intern going around and reading meters all over the place, and you have to trust that the, the reading that they're, they're writing down on their scratch pad is actually accurate. Um, it's very hard to have assurance in the old system, at least with connectivity, there, there is an audit trail, and they can produce that, and they can they can show that. I, I don't think anyone's taken them to court yet to prove it, but, but at least you would have um, validation that it, it was read at a certain time, and here's the data we read. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much.